Uh, so it's my pleasure to welcome back Roland Reuter, and he will give the last part of his mini course on renormalization group and critical phenomenon in hierarchical models of statistical physics. Thank you very much. It's uh, it's great to be back at Stony Brook, even if it's only vir even if it's only virtually, and um, it's uh, great to talk about statistical physics to everybody. And, um, there is there is some noise. Some noise. It's the um, ah, it's gone. Okay not the uh, high temperature. <laughs> so um, this is a reminder of what I did on Wednesday, a brief reminder. Um, I talked about the uh, phenomenology of magnets and what critical exponents physically, if you were to measure uh, physical quantities. I talked about the Ising model and uh, partition functions, Fisher zeros, Liang zeros, and Liang Fisher zeros, and about the thermodynamic limit, taking the limit of the size of your lattice size of your graphs going to infinity and trying to understand what happens with these zeros as the number of zeros goes to infinity. And then I um, talked a little bit about the expected properties of these um, zeros and the uh, expected thermodynamic properties uh, for the ZD lattice. And um, that's where I was. And my intent today is to um, recall enough that if you weren't here on a Wednesday that you can still happily uh, follow and so the first thing I'll do is I'll review the setting with some kind of uh, simplifications that won't be um, of crucial um, uh, issues. Oops, my sharing has stopped. Sorry, my sharing stopped for a minute. Um, so I plan to review the setting. And um, then I want to talk about the uh, Migdal approximation, which allows you to approximate the Z2 or even the ZD lattice um, Ising model with a uh, version where you can actually reinterpret things and get a exact renormalization in uh, finitely many variables and two variables. And that'll give us the uh, diamond hierarchical lattice, which is our main uh, player here. And we'll have migdal katanov renormalization on this uh, diamond hierarchical lattice. So, uh, and then I want to basically have three parts. Uh, it's very ambitious, we'll see if I have time. I want to talk about the Fisher zeros for the DHL, which is one dimensional complex dynamics. And uh, it's kind of the first thing that you can do with this renormalization. And then I'll talk about the Li-Yang zeros for the DHL, which is in some sense two-dimensional real dynamics. And uh, it's a bit trickier than the Fisher zeros. And finally, um, in the uh, optimistic view of the world, I will talk about the Li-Yang Fisher zeros for the DHL, which is a situation that you can study with uh, two-dimensional complex dynamics. So that's what I would like to do. And I, it's going to be a little bit of an overview and not too detailed, um, but to give you a picture of what uh, what Misha Pavel and I have done and some other people before us have done. So, uh, so that's the plan. And uh, we have a sequence of graphs, gamma n, of increasing size as n goes to infinity. You can imagine the uh, n by n square grid. Uh, that's a good example, or the n by n by n cubicle grid. And uh, associated to each of these graphs, gamma n is a polynomial. Uh, Zn of z and t. So it's a two variable polynomial indexed by n. It's, there's a formula for it in terms of your graph. It's called the partition function. And um, t is e to the minus 2j over capital T. j is your coupling constant for how much the electrons want to be energetically uh, aligned, have the same spins um, aligned. And capital T is the temperature. So we think of little t as basically being the temperature, just think temperature. It's between zero and one. Uh, zero for little t is zero physical temperature. One for little t is infinite physical temperature. And uh, little z is e to the minus h over t. Even though it has t in it, we think of it as being a magnetic field-like variable. So I'm not going to actually go back to the physical variables again. I'm just going to work with little z and little t uh, for the rest of today. So um, we have zeros of these polynomials. It's a polynomial in two variables, Zn. And uh, so you can consider it's zero locus in C2, which is an algebraic curve. And uh, I'm going to denote this as S sub n. And um, as the n goes to infinity, the degrees of these algebraic curves are going to infinity. The complexity is getting higher and higher. And you should wonder what happens as n goes to infinity. That can be very difficult. So there are some particular slices that you might be interested in. 
that are mostly uh, most relevant for physics, perhaps. There's the uh, Fisher zeros, which is if you put z equal to one, we think of that as a vertical one-dimensional complex line in C2. And um, this is when a uh, magnetic field is zero. So maybe I should just say magnetic field. Uh, Roland. Yes. When you define Sn, it should be a, a partition function equal to zero. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Thank you, of course. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So it's the zero locus of this. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And so the Fisher zeros are the zero locus of the partition function when you have a zero external magnetic field. This is like uh, the situation of the Onsager solution is zero external magnetic field. Um, you also have the uh, Li Yang zeros, which then you fix a temperature, little t equal to t naught. I think of that as a horizontal complex line. And then you study the zeros of the partition function in that horizontal complex line. These are the Li Yang zeros. It's a finite collection of zeros in the complex plane. And uh, the Li Yang theorem tells you that these zeros live on the unit circle. And so this is a kind of an amazing situation where you have these very wild and complicated polynomials, but you have very good control on the zeros that they always live on the unit circle. So that's the setting. And um, I want to draw a cartoon picture of it just to remind people of what's, what's going on. And um, so here we think of, uh, I don't know why my pen is so thick. Um, okay. We think of T as being kind of vertical Z is being kind of horizontal, and um, the Li Yang cylinder, this is just a cartoon, the Li Yang cylinder is something like this. This is mod Z equals one, T is between zero and one. And uh, oops. so that's the Li Yang cylinder. We have the vertical line, this is z equals one. So you have a vertical complex line at z equals one. And then you've got the algebraic curve of zeros, which I'm not going to draw very well, but this is some sort of algebraic curve, Sn, algebraic curve. And we were interested in the uh, Fisher zeros, which is some sort of finitely many zeros in the z equals one vertical complex plane, one dimensional complex plane, or we can fix the temperature, t equal to t naught, and then we could have some uh, Li Yang zeros within there. Li Yang zeros. So the kind of picture to have in mind is that most generally we're interested in all of C2, However, that can be very difficult. And these particular slices, the complex vertical line, z equals one, varying complex t, and the uh, real cylinder, mod z equals one, t is between zero and one are kind of the preferred slices where physicists might be most interested in these zeros. So that's the setting. Are there any questions on just the, the general setting? Okay. So um, in order to understand the phase transitions, you want to take the uh, degree of your polynomials to infinity, which is the same as taking the size of your finite graphs to infinity. To do that, uh, it's convenient to think about free energy, which we're going to define. This is a slight variant of the classical free energy. is simply log of the modulus of this partition function. So all that is is a, a pluripotential for the algebraic curve of zeros. So if you like pluripotential theory, that's what it is. If you prefer one dimensional complex analysis, you can think of it just as a potential for the zeros. In our special slices, the Fisher zeros, if you just plug in z equals one, then you get a logarithmic potential in the vertical t plane look with uh, poles exactly at the Fisher zeros. For the Liang zeros, if you plug in t equals t naught, you get a logarithmic potential on the Liang zeros. And um, I'm not going to write the normalization here, but we, to take a limit, we're going to have to normalize these free energies by the uh, 
degree of the polynomial. So that then when we take a limit, we have a kind of a uniform bound on the, on the mass. And the question is, when you do that, does the limit exist in L1 loc of C2, if you're looking at the full, the full picture, or in L1 loc of C, if you're looking at one of these special slices? That's going to be equivalent to there being a limiting measure in the particular slices of the zeros or a limiting current of the zeros in C2. And the idea is that the phase transitions correspond to places where this limiting free energy behaves non-analytically. So this is just a review of where we were. Um, and there's a convenient um, equivalent way to think about it. Basically for the Fisher zeros, you can either think about the limiting free energy, you can either think about the limiting free energy, or you can think about its logarithmic, it can be expressed as this uh, logarithmic potential of this limiting measure, nu, describing the limit of the zeros, the weak limit of the Fisher zeros. And uh, coming from dynamical systems, I somehow prefer the measures over the potentials. Uh, similarly, for the Li Yang zeros, you've got exactly the analogous thing. You fix, uh, you fix T naught, and then you um, take the limit, and you get a measure mu T naught supported on the unit circle. And again, you take the logarithmic potential of it. So you can go between the zeros and the free energy. And if you like, with the Li Yang Fisher zeros, you can ask about the limit in L1 loc of C2. And then if you have that happening, you can look on almost any complex line or complex curve in C2, and you'll have the same picture. The zeros of the finite end partition functions will um, suitably normalized and putting Dirac measures on each of them will converge to a limiting measure, which is described in an analogous way using the logarithmic potential. So the point is that this Li Yang Fisher zeros organizes the Li Yang zeros and the Fisher zeros into one kind of object. So to talk about the phase transitions, one useful technique is to study the uh, logarithmic potentials of measures. And uh, so this was a lemma or a proposition I put last time. You have a, um, you have a, the real line and you're looking at something where you're going across it. You're looking at um, F mu of I Y. F mu is this logarithmic potential of the measure. And you're asking how singular is F mu as you cross through the real line mu is supported on R. And there's this nice proposition that tells you that after removing, after subtracting some kind of polynomial, that the uh, singularity is the same, the kind of singularity of F mu, if you plot it something like that, this is like F mu of I Y, the singularity here is exactly like Y to the kappa, where kappa is the uh, pointwise dimension of the measure at the origin. So studying the pointwise dimensions of these measures is um, on the real line, if it's a Li Yang measure, is the same as studying the critical exponent of the free energy as you go perpendicularly across it. So th this is something I was discussing a little bit last time. Any comments or questions on that? Opinions? <laughs> okay. I think it's a really nice thing and um, Unfortunately, when I move the slide forward, all of my writing is going to disappear. I learned this from actually from this paper by uh, Mueller Hartman, uh, this physics paper from the 70s. And uh, I think it's pretty probably well known among experts, but it's something that I didn't know when I learned it from, from there. So this is really nice because it allows you to compute critical exponents directly from pointwise dimensions. Now, there's one problem with it is that it required 
that the measure be supported on the, uh, on the real axis. And so for the Liang zeros, that would be okay because the measure is supported on the circle, on the unit circle. And so if you straighten it out, it's, it's a real axis. But for the Fisher zeros or for other situations, your zeros might not be, the limiting measure might not be supported exactly on a analytic curve, on a real analytic curve. It might be some more complicated setting. So what I'd like to do, I'd like to mention a kind of proposed proposition that I didn't actually, I don't have a reference for it and I don't have a proof for it, but it's gotta be true. I've asked some experts and they didn't tell me a reference. Um, but they think it's true. Um, so let me tell you this. Um, so for like the Fisher zeros, the previous proposition isn't so good. So what's happening here, we have the real axis, but then your measure, your measure is not supported just on the real axis, it's supported in some kind of cone. So the support of the measure is in here and um, you're trying to go across F of I why, uh, but the, the measure is supported in this cone centered on the real axis. So it's almost the same, except that you're allowed to be not just on the real line, but not very close to where, the, where you're traveling on your free energy, except right at the cone point. So you have that. And um, then the statement is basically the same, the proposed statement. The proposed statement is again, if you take the pointwise dimension, this is the pointwise dimension, that that is exactly your critical exponent. So I've never actually really thought about the Fisher zeros myself. And so having only thought about Li Yang zeros, I never needed this proposition, but this is exactly the kind of thing you want. Um, let me mention one thing. What does this dimension mean? Big dimension. I'm sorry that my pen is so thick. Big dimension means sparse measure. For the dimension to be big, that means that mu of the disk of radius delta is much closer to zero than, um, than a delta itself. So your measure is extremely sparse. And that would correspond, big measure would correspond to very mild, oops, very mild kind of singularities a big dimension, I'm sorry. Small, small dimension would correspond to very abrupt singularities. So this is a great opportunity to ask, maybe everybody knows this statement. Does anybody know a reference for this? So when Fisher wrote his original papers, um, he emphasized for the case of um, his zero, what, what later became known as his zeros. Also, I should note some Japanese did, including Abe, person okay. named Abe, that the density of zeros, uh, so Fisher zeros coming down on the, the relevant circle in those two circles would go like rho to the one minus alpha, where alpha is the critical exponent for the specific heat. And of oh, course, cool. this, they didn't say this rigorously or anything, but that, but that notion of a connection between the density of zeros as you approach the real axis and the critical exponent, in that case, alpha, um, what was inherent in, in the original papers in 1965. Yeah. Right, right. But my sense is that somehow everybody, but me apparently knows this. Um, and no, so no, 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 it, it, <laughs> you're, you're right. I mean, the, the, um, the, the way that the field developed, um, the, the uh, understanding of critical exponents was later based on the RG, not on densities of zero. So right. that's part of why the Fisher zeros were never really pursued that much. Uh -huh. um, RG just took over as of the early 70s and uh, people largely forgot about the zeros. Right. So for better or for worse, RG is going to take over in my talk on the next slide. Yeah. Uh, I, 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 I'm just wondering if Frost, it's sort of Frostman style thing. I, I don't know it exactly, but it could huh. have been in his thesis. He looked it at this be. type of, of logarithmic potentials and so on, right? So it's, you can make a very similar question about the Cauchy transform of a measure. 
And yes. I wrote to some kind of experts on the Cauchy transform. And yeah. they uh, told me they never think about such things. They always think about things that my, in my mind are way more complicated that I could never understand. But simple things like this, they never think about. No, but Frostman's thesis uh, huh. uh, really dealt with uh, things of this type. I, didn't, I don't remember it. I've never read it so carefully. Huh. I mean, Sasha Wolberg will be giving a talk here in a couple of weeks. We can check with him. I'm sure that it should be known to, to people like well, like Michael, actually. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I look it up. I look it up from this point of view. I can look it up. Okay. Who, who is it, Misha? That's coming. That's with this? Sasha. Sasha Wolberg. Wolberg. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. No, I mean any kind of. People from the right area of analysis, it should be their bread and butter. That is, that is exactly the right area of analysis. So. Yeah, so for me, I mean, it's far from what I normally think about. So. Yeah. I mean, I honestly suspect the, pay, the proof from this Muller Hartman Zittart, um, Ivan Chu and I have uh, written it up in a paper that we wrote with, with some co authors. And it's very simple if you're on the real line. And I would honestly suspect that maybe with just diligent work, you can just adapt it. But I'm not totally sure. Anyway, um, as Robert said, the renormalization takes over, so let, let us do that. Um, program is on renormalization. But I think this is a very nice kind of picture, so I wanted to mention it. So here's the Migdal approximation. And this is a funny thing. Um, so at very low temperatures, of course, it's favorable for neighboring spins to be aligned. The, the energy is lower if the neighboring spins are aligned. And so uh, Migdal proposed for example, if you look at the two to the n plus one by two to the n plus one rectangular grid, that you can approximate the uh, partition function by a kind of partition function where you put further restrictions on the spins. So I'm going to illustrate these conditions in a, in a minute. It's, but the spins should be constant on the vertical and horizontal boundaries, maybe different constants, maybe plus at the top, minus at the bottom, plus on one side, minus on the other side. They should be constant on each of the four branches of this kind of central cross of it. They should be constant on each of the four branches of each of the four subcrosses. There's this kind of hierarchical view already showing up in this approximation, et cetera. So, so for example, it could be, you know, it should be constant on this whole thing, maybe plus, it should be constant on this whole thing, maybe minus, constant on this whole piece, maybe minus. Uh, uh, Pavel Blacher and I were discussing because I was nervous about contradictions, but uh, it's an approximation, so we're not going to worry about it. Um, and uh, maybe it's minus here. And then you go down to the next subcross, the main subcross, and it should be constant on this, maybe a plus. It should be constant on this part, maybe a minus. Of course, there's a kind of coll collision, but when n gets very big, these collisions are very small in uh, proportion, so it doesn't affect the approximation, maybe minus, maybe plus, and then you keep going. It should be constant on this piece, minus, constant on this piece, plus, something like that, etc. And so it's kind of a um, first order approximation to the partition function. And uh, it should work well at very, very low temperatures but it's some kind of an approximation. Does that make sense? Why not? Good. <laughs> <laughs> I spent a lot of time wrapping my head around it. I just learned this recently. And uh, well, I, I want things to be exact. So the kind of approximation of it made it confusing to me. But um, it's a really fantastic idea, I think. And uh, so what's really awesome about it is if you look at this picture, I'm gonna draw the picture again, but the claim is that, so Z tilde is this partition function where you make this restriction on the spins. And if you take one half of the Z tilde, that corresponds to just summing over the vertical bonds. You can sum over for the partition function, you can sum over the edges and you're summing over the vert vertical bonds and then separately the horizontal ones. And the reason it's just bonds is because you have these, these uh, constant spins on the chunks. And so it turns out that if you just sum over vertical bonds, that then you have these kind of uh, 
you know, again, you should be constant spins there, that's too thick. You should be constant spins there, constant spins there, constant there, constant there, constant on this two, length two piece, constant on this length two piece, constant on these pieces, etc. You should imagine this is much bigger, but then you see, instead of doing a coupling like from here to here and from here to, or, sorry, I just didn't say that right, from here to here and from here to here, etc. You can just think of it as a coupling like that because the spins are constant on the top row. And like this, and like this, and like this. So because of the spins are constant on the top row, it basically brings these four edges together at the top. And similarly here, because the spins are constant on this row, it brings together two edges here, etc. So if you do this, and I don't want to get into the combinatorics, but if you do this, you um, the Migdal approximate partition function, one half of it is exactly the partition function for the lattice gamma tilde that's in blue, this very non-regular lattice. However, you have to be a little bit careful. Your, your uh, energy coming from the magnetic field should be uh, summed over edges, not over vertices. So you make a little adaptation to the energy. So the, the moral is that doing this Migdal approximation, which happens at low temperature, somehow produces these crazy looking sequence of graphs, gamma and tilde, and that they should be reasonably accurate at low temperature. Okay, well, that's good, but what's even better um, so let me just define these. So this sequence of graphs, I'm not going to put the tildes anymore, so I'm just going to call them gammas, gamma n. This sequence of graphs obtained by doing this construction, the uh, zeroth one is just a single edge. The first one is a diamond. The second one is this one. This is the one from our picture, etc. And they're obtained by um, gluing to the nth one is obtained by gluing together four copies of the n minus first ones. So you see there are four copies of the diamond glued together here, et cetera. So, you're, so if I were to make the next one, I would take four copies of this thing and glue them together in a diamond pattern to make an even bigger conglomeration of these guys. And, um, what's, and so I'm going to drop the tildes. So I'll just talk about Zn as the partition function for these diamond hier hierarchical lattice graphs. And it's going to be with this modified energy where you sum over edges, sum over edges. And what's really great about this is that then uh, you can actually renormalize exactly infinitely many variables. There's no kind of approximations. So here's how you do your renormalization you define these conditional partition functions. So, um, so un is the partition function, but you suppose that the vertices at the top and bottom are both plus. You only sum up over, sorry. <coughs> sorry. Um, you only sum up over the uh, spin configurations where the spins are plus at the top and bottom. There are these kind of natural marked vertices in the construction. And so un is the sum of Gibbs weights over all configurations restricted upon having plus at the marked vertices a and b. Vn is the analogous thing, but you have a plus and a minus, or a minus and a plus. The diamond graph is symmetric under switching them. And wn, you have minus and minus. So then if you want the whole partition function, you just sum up un plus 2vn plus wn, and that gives you the whole partition function. The reason this is good is that you can then renormalize. You get these, you get this, um, this, uh, these equations. And so you get this very simple polynomial recursion in uh, three variables. So it's, it's just, it's a different kind of level of complexity than what, uh, what Pavel was talking about with the Dyson hierarchical lattice. There he was renormalizing in the space of these, uh, uh, these uh, free measures, these free probability measures. Here we're renormalizing in the space of three complex numbers. 
So it's, it's much closer to what a lot of us here typically think about because it's a iteration of a rational function or polynomial function, if you want to think that way, in finitely many variables. So um, any questions at the moment? So would it be fair to say that it is just essential variables for this migdal kadanov model? So somehow these three variables, or two of them, rather than external field and temperature. Right. Somehow in the Dyson model, there, are, there is this infinite dimensional space, but still there is only one essential parameter. And here you have two essential parameters, and the determination acts on them uh, uh, explicitly. So there is this kind of, I could imagine that in the right, rightly post uh, setting, there should be infinite dimensional space with two functionals, temperature and field, and the invariant foliation so that the modernization acts on the quotient to parameter space. Would it be a, some fair picture to make to imagine? <clears throat> it's a good question. Um... Because uh, uh, probably can introduce much more parameters how to this model, but then essential parameters would be on the. So, so in uh, in Pavel's case, for example, the temperature wasn't um wasn't a function on the base of these right. measures. So that is, that's exactly the difference. Right. Yeah, that's right. exactly the difference. Right, and and here I guess somehow these guys actually should be. But still, the right space should be infinite, infinite dimensional. I could imagine that there should be infinite dimensional space of fields. Uh, uh, uh. Pavel, what do you think? Well, I'm not sure what, 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 what's the question. So the question is whether these two parameters should be enlarged to infinitely many parameters so they should, <laughs> to consider certain space of fields infinite dimensional space of fields and these two parameters will be just two coordinates on this field set, which happen to be so um, to be invariant not invariant but well which happen to define an invariant foliation in this infinite dimensional space okay so uh, how i uh, i think of, of this is this uh, right in general you have a normalization of the whole Hamiltonian, but here we have yeah. normalization of basically uh, temperature and uh, magnetic field. There are three variables, but it's easy to reduce it to two variables. And uh, it is sort of ideal situation for immunization group when your uh, immunization just acts on temperature yeah. and magnetic field. Well, yeah, somehow here you don't need to introduce other interaction parameters because remember, yeah. X is already on the essential parameters somehow by miracle. Uh, okay, so, yeah, uh, right. <laughs> Another way of saying that is that this hmm. is really a bi, what's called a bicritical point. And that means that there are two relevant scaling variables. Of course, as you say, there are an infinite, in general, there are an infinite number of irrelevant variables. Yes, but the nice thing about this model or similar models is that the the RG equations close, and so you can just stay within that set of the two relevant variables. Yeah. Yeah. Well, but yeah, I can say a kind of a blue collar interpretation of what was just said that is maybe how I think about it is that. If if you wanted to try to try to do this renormalization on the actual square lattice, you might have these squares and you keep track of the boundary conditions. And then you that's one level, and then you've got the next level, and then you're trying to glue together squares. But the number of boundary conditions increases as the scale increases. So you're every time you glue, you have more variables because you're trying to glue together conditional partition functions with more and more conditions as the size of the chunks goes to infinity. Sure. And here, we're always gluing together at exactly four points. We always glue together four copies right. of the thing. And so we, we just have to keep track of finitely many variables because we're gluing at a uniform number of sites. 
But as I said, it's the blue collar interpretation. Oh, that's fine. That, that's a very good way of saying it. Absolutely. Yeah. Because there's some sort of a dream that I think is the dream many people have had of doing something where you're keeping track of all of the sites and doing this real space renormalization, but it's your um, number of variables gets out of hand very quickly. Okay, so let me, um, I, I wanted to put some kind of reference where people can look, and this is the one that I know for where you can find this. Um, let me briefly just show you for people who haven't seen this before that the derivation of these equations is completely elementary. It's not some sort of deep, difficult thing. The point is like, if you wanted to derive UN plus one, well, that's ZN plus one with a plus plus, and you can then consider four different cases, plus, 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 or plus, 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 minus, or with the plus and minus on the horizontal switch till you get two of them, or plus, plus, minus, minus. And so you can just sum up over these four partition functions with additional conditions on these um, horizontal vertices. And then once you, once you fix the um, spins at all four vertices of your conglomerate diamond thing, then the, um, pre, the, the partition function is exactly the product of the corresponding little partition function. So here is a, here is a UN, here is a UN, etc. cetera. Whereas here is a UN and like here would be a, v, a VN because it's plus minus. And so there's this kind of, uh, very simple reasoning for why this works. And uh, it relies upon the fact that you're summing over edges for everything that's important here. So um, I want to get to the actual dynamics. And so what are the initial conditions? You can just compute the um, n equals zero is just a single edge with the two marked vertices a and b. So you can compute u zero, v zero, and w zero. There are these functions, u zero is this thing. These are just explicit computations using the Gibbs weights. And the whole partition function is, is this. And so it's given by, by that. So as uh, was mentioned, uh, as Pavel mentioned, you can actually, you, well, first of all, you can think of this mapping as a mapping. If you just care about zeros of the partition function, which I was trying to convince you is the right thing to do, um, you can think of this as a rational map from the complex projective plane to itself given by a triple of homogeneous polynomials. And then there's this kind of trick is that if you take that mapping downstairs, there's a way to lift it upstairs to this mapping script R that's literally in the field. So this is renormalizing, renormalizing in field Z and temperature T. So it becomes even more kind of physical feeling if you work in this uh, change of variables upstairs. So it's, it's really natural to, in some physical way to think about renormalizing using this mapping, script R instead of the one in terms of the conditional partition functions. All right. So I'm gonna call either of these the migdal Kadanoff renormalization for the uh, uh, DHL. So let's talk about the Fisher zeros. Uh, the Fisher zeros are uh, Z equals one. And so it turns out that the line Z equals one is invariant under this two variable mapping, if you plug in z equals one into the first coordinate, you get z equals one back. So really you just have one dimensional dynamics. You just iterate this nice looking rational map. And you can check from the formulae that of course the, well, that the Fisher zeros from gamma zero are just t equals minus one. And then the Fisher zeros for gamma n for the nth graph are just the pullbacks of t equals minus one under the nth iterate of the mapping. So this is a classical problem from uh, holomorphic dynamics in one variable. And uh, the problem that Misha studied and others have studied. And so in particular, since minus one is not exceptional, you do a little calculation. This uh, Lubitsch and Fourier lopez manier theorem tells you that if you put a Dirac mass at each of these zeros for the nth pullbacks, that the, uh, these measures, uh, normalized measures, uh, weakly converge to the measure of maximal entropy nu for R of t. And so immediately you get that the limiting measure of 
well, I wrote it in the slides, the limiting measure is the MME. And that's fantastic because the MME for the rational map is something that people from holomorphic dynamics study constantly. And so you could really can derive a lot of information about the Fisher zeros using holomorphic dynamics. And it's supported, of course, on the Julia set of R. So here's the Julia set is the boundary between the uh, light and dark gray. And for relevant scales, the, um, this box is, uh, goes over to here. And uh, hopefully you can see, this is the unit interval. This is t equals zero, this is t equals one. And the place where you, where you cross the Julia set is exactly your critical point in the temperatures. This is, um, remember we had the Fisher zeros were like, it's a bad picture, but the Fisher zeros is like you started there and you went, you know, here's one, here's zero, and there was TC. This is exactly the hierarchical lattice version of Fisher zeros, which is, is awesome. Um, and it's much more interesting looking than the actual Fisher zeros. It's much more complicated. So, moreover, using that the MME, when you pull it back under your renormalization mapping, it multiplies by a factor of four, you can compute that the pointwise dimension at the critical point is log four over log of the derivative at the critical point is 2.67. And I'm going to show you how to do that calculation just to, to we actually feel like we computed a critical exponent. Um, but that's exactly related to the specific heat critical exponent, which I, which I wrote on the uh, slides from Wednesday. So computing this pointwise dimension really is computing the specific heat critical exponent. And, you know, pointwise dimensions are things that people in dynamics just love. I mean, for example, as uh, Michael Benedicts mentioned uh, last time, that there's this uh, Le Drapier-Young formula relating dimension, entropy, and uh, the Lyapunov exponents, and this is very closely tied into that kind of thing. So here I've got a nice blank slide, and I'm going to try to explain for you the, uh, the picture. Let me just draw some sort of cartoon Julia set. Here's TC, here's the Julia set, J. And what we want to do is we want to compute or approximate log nu, nu is our measure, log nu of d delta of tc over log two delta. I put a two, uh, you could use log delta, it doesn't matter. So, so what do you do? You can take your little disk of radius delta, d delta, and then um, since you're near a repelling fixed point, tc is a repelling fixed point, point, um, as you iterate out, you're going to iterate out and you're going to get something um, R the N of D delta is going to be approximately lambda C times D delta, where you take lambda C to the N. This is the multiplier, lambda C. And so the idea is, as delta is getting small, you choose N so that this is of definite size. This meaning, meaning that. And that will imply that mu, I'm sorry, nu, our measure, because it hits a definite amount of the Julia set, that implies that nu of r to the n delta is comparable to one, because it, it eats up a definite proportion of the measure, okay? But then using our transformation rule, this is four to the n nu of d delta. And so you can get from this, this implies that log nu d delta is comparable to and then make a little bit more space. This is comparable to n log four. Four is the degree of the map, remember. Um, so degree four rational map. So we can put that into our nice formula here. Okay. 
So I'll just make an approximation symbol n log four. And then we need to approximate um, the denominator. And so the point is that how do you relate n to delta? Maybe I'll use this color. So lambda to the n d delta is kind of, is approximately the disk of radius one. So that implies that lambda to the n delta is comparable to one. And these are kind of standard types of calculations, but I think it's healthy for people to see them, uh, which implies that log delta um, is comparable to n log uh, lambda. So let me just cheat slightly and make this log delta. It doesn't matter for my calculations. And so then the denominator becomes n log lambda. And so we get log four, which was the log of the degree over log delta, which was d nu at tc. So that's, that's the calculation. It's kind of a, after you see somebody do this, it's kind of an easy calculation but it's good to see people do this because otherwise it looks like it could be more complicated. Um, so the point is that just a very simple calculation like that gives you your critical exponent. You don't, you don't need um, Onsager's solution. You just do this very simple holomorphic dynamics stuff, this kind of thing. So, um, so I computed a critical exponent. Let me go on to the Liang zeros because I, uh, you know, I don't want to just stop at the Fisher zeros. And so here is the Li-Yang cylinder. This is where the Li-Yang zeros live. Mod Z is one, T is between zero and one. And you can check that our rational map R sends the cylinder to itself. The zeroth level zeros of the partition function are given by that formula. And the N plus first ones are just the pullbacks of the level N ones. So I've got a cartoon picture. So here's S zero, here's the cylinder C. You pull it back under R and you get more Li Yang zeros. Here I'm considering the Li Yang zeros on the whole cylinder. If you wanted to fix TC or T naught, it would be some horizontal slice on the cylinder, right? You keep going and you iteratively pull back and you're getting this uh, sequence of laminations, vertical laminations on the cylinder whose complexity is getting higher and higher as n goes to infinity. And so the name of the game is to somehow describe the limit of this sequence of laminations as n goes to infinity in a measure theoretic way is what you need to do. So um, here's a little bit about the renormalization mapping. It's very important that this mapping R has uh, indeterminate points alpha at the top of the cylinder. And I can, I've got a picture here, here are the alphas. Here's alpha minus, here's alpha plus. And if you approach alpha one of them say alpha minus at some angle, then you map out to some particular point on this, on this G curve. So as you approach these indeterminate C points at different angles, you, your limiting values of the function are different points on this curve. So this is a phenomenon in higher dimensional rational maps that doesn't happen in one dimension. And it's a, it's a tremendous uh, problem. And that, that really, many of the difficulties in what we did comes from that. Uh, the circle at the bottom, uh, the map is z goes to z to the fourth, is transversely super attracting. Um, its basin of attraction is an open neighborhood. Um, there are some collapsing intervals. I want to speed a little bit over that. Uh, the circle at the top, t equals one, um, the restriction of the mapping is z goes to z squared. The degree is different. Um, it's non-uniformly transversely super attracting. And uh, the indeterminate points allow you to be very close to the top, arbitrarily close to the top and sent all the way to the bottom. And so, um, and it turns out that the basin of attraction for the top has positive Lebesgue measure. So this is better shown with a computer picture than with these words. So let me show you the computer picture. So this is the numerical experiment. Um, points in blue are at points whose orbits converge to the bottom of the cylinder. This is the bottom. And points in uh, points in yellow converge to the top. Have orbits converging to the top, and you can see here are the uh, indeterminate points there and there. And in fact, there are entire lines, vertical lines there that get sent down 
to a, a point on the bottom. So this mapping is actually really strange. Um, it has indeterminate points and it has lines that are collapsed down to the bottom. Um, it's really it's sort of remarkably tricky. Um, you can think about it in the sense that these indeterminate points at the top make it so your phase space is not compact. And that's a constant problem. That's a lot of modern problems in dynamical systems come from non-compact phase spaces. And I think that's a, a fair justification for why it's hard to study this thing. So here are some dynamical results about this mapping. Um, the main dynamical theorem that uh, Misha, Pavel, and I proved is that this mapping on the cylinder is partially hyperbolic. Uh, what does it mean? It means that there's a horizontal cone field, a, a vertical line field, both of them depending continuously on your point and invariant under the mapping. And so here's a kind of cartoon picture of what that invariance means. The uh, cone, the cone at X, the, the cone here at X maps inside, maps to this green cone here, uh, inside the cone at R of X and similarly for the vertical lines. But moreover, if you take a uh, tangent vector in the horizontal cones, they get stretched under the iterates of the derivative um, at exponential rate, faster than whatever can happen in the vertical direction. In the vertical direction, you can stretch exponentially or contract, but always slower than the horizontal. It's some basically the standard notion of partial hyperbolicity, but we're adapting to a uh, many to one mapping. So we don't have the uh, two different line bundles. We have a cone describing the unstable quote bundle. Um, it turns out that this mapping has a unique central foliation. It's a vertical foliation. Um, it goes from the bottom to the top. That's some sort of like a limiting version of these laminations coming from the Liang zeros. Um, the foliation has C infinity regularity in the basin of the bottom. Uh, Scott Kashner and I proved that this foliation is actually not real analytic anywhere on the cylinder. That was a very delicate thing. Um, it's C infinity in the basin of the bottom, but not real analytic, which is interesting, I think. Um, and uh, Misha Pavel and I proved that almost any point in the cylinder is in the basin of the bottom or the top. So that's, uh, that's related to the fact that in the picture, you don't see some kind of big set of black set of points that don't have orbits converged to the bottom or the top. All you see is yellow and blue. So that means that you don't see a positive measure set of other behavior. And uh, I don't want to expound upon it, but in fact, the, uh, this is an instance of this intertwined basins phenomenon that uh, Kahn York, Bonafont Milner, and uh, Klepsen, Ilyashenko, Saltikov, and others have studied. So how about the Li Yang zeros? That's what we're supposed to be talking about, not about dynamical systems. Um, so the holonomy transformation, what you do is you just take a point, for example, there, and you just follow the central foliation. Each point is on a unique leaf of the central foliation and you just follow it. So you can do the holonomy transformation here from the bottom of the cylinder up to a given height. And that's just following the foliation, the usual notion. And um, our physical theorem describing the limiting measure of Li Yang zeros is that um, at the bottom, at temperature zero, the measure is Lebesgue. Lebesgue. So mu naught equals Lebesgue. And mu t is gt push forward of mu naught. So you take Lebesgue measure at the bottom and you holonome it up to the height that you want. And this holonomy has very interesting um, properties. It's once you get above the critical temperature, it's not, um, it's not smooth, it's, it's really wild. And that's how you're going to get your critical exponents and all of your interesting aspects of the distribution of Li Yang zeros. So I had this kind of cartoon picture for what should be expected for the Z2 lattice. Here's the analogous thing. At temperature zero, you have Lebesgue measure. At small temperature, you have a positive C infinity density of Li Yang zeros. Suddenly you reach critical temperature, which is exactly how far down these hairs come. This is that they stop there. That's the, the furthest down that the points in the basin of the top reach. And you get this uh, density 
which is C infinity except at zero and pi, minus pi if you like, and you have a critical exponent there for the density. And we can compute it. I'm gonna state what it is in a minute and uh, maybe I'll compute it. Um, you get above critical temperature and suddenly your, uh, your limiting measure of Liang zeros, it's supported on countably many intervals, exactly the intervals where your height hits the basin of the bottom. And so for example, this interval would correspond to this kind of, this is just some sort of cartoon plot of the density being positive and see infinity there. We don't know, for example, that the endpoints go like that. They could actually, they could actually diverge. We don't know for sure, but you have this countable union of intervals and the density is uh, positive on it. And uh, the union of them is a full measure. They get narrower, they get pinched against a Cantor set of uh, increasing measure as your temperature goes up. And finally, at infinite temperature, you get a countable union of Dirac masses. Although you're saying that union of this interval is full measure, it is this, the complementary Cantor set has positive measure. So right. So I think I said I think I said it wrong. So the yeah. so the I said these intervals are getting squeezed squeezed in between a Cantor set of increasing measure. Ah. Yeah. I, I might have said it wrong. I'm. Uh, my yes, coffee is wearing out. Is it this kind of important point? Yes, it's yeah, a yeah. Is positive measure. Yeah, which... so, so the fact that the counter set is positive measure, I mean, you can see it by the fact that the yellow set is visible. It's a positive measure. <laughs> and it's like every... The blue yeah. region becomes invisible completely near the top here. Yeah. Right, exactly. This counter kind of set occupies almost any... Right. Almost and any it's sort of like for the classical picture, your Liang zero should be concentrated very much near near these two points just two points in the circle. Here we're getting squeezed, not outside of some interval, but outside of some Cantor set. So this is a slide that I don't expect you to actually read because there's a ton of information there, but this is the kind of official summary of the picture that we have in our paper. And among other things, let me just point out that you can explicitly compute the critical exponent for the density and it's here. So that was this picture. Remember the density was like this and like that, and here was zero and pi, this was rho tc of phi. And so you can explicitly compute this, uh, these critical exponents. And that is something that I had thought of doing. Do I have five minutes left? Yes, for sure. Okay, so there are two possibilities. I could either compute this critical exponent, which is related to this critical exponent for the magnetization as you cross through the Li-Yang circle, or I could talk for five minutes about the Li-Yang Fisher zeros. Mm. Maybe let us stick to Li-Yang zeros. So that okay. The, this uh, dynamical description will have some physical meaning. Okay. I never actually talk about the Li-Yang Fisher zeros because the Li-Yang zeros are interesting enough, it seems. Oh. Okay. So let me explain that basically this computation of this exponent is almost exactly the same construction as in the uh, Fisher zeros. So, oh, so the magnetization critical exponent, this was the thing that was like one over 15th in the um, Z2 Ising model. Z2 it was like one 15th, here it's this thing. So just for comparison. So, um, so let me try to explain this. So the, here is T, here is phi, which is arg z. Um, here is TC, here is one, and maybe here is the whole Liang cylinder. So what we want to do is we want to compute, this is some interval, I delta. I delta is, you could think of it, you could write it as minus delta delta cross T C, okay? So we're gonna take this little tiny horizontal interval. And what we want to do is we want to compute, we're interested in this uh, D, I should say space, I shouldn't write so big, um, we're interested in D, you know, D zero 
and I guess my notation was the other way, d mu tc of zero, which is this limit of mu tc of i delta. I need to take the logarithm, log divided by log of this technique that I'm using here, it works in all kinds of greater generality. If you have some invariant measures, you can use Lyapunov exponents and take regular points for the measure and so on. But I'm just trying to show you the simplest view of this. So, um, so how do we do it? Well, let's look at the foliation. Um, let me make my interval slightly longer. You should, these intervals should be thought of as being arbitrarily small. In fact, their size is going to zero. But you should take the foliation and consider some two leaves going through the boundaries. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to iterate. This point is a fixed point. I'm going to iterate until the uh, thing is of some sort of definite length, r to the n of i delta, and I'm going to suppose its length is comparable to 1. So like it goes once around the cylinder, but not four times around the cylinder or something. OK. And so, so this specifies n. OK. Now, that tells you that um, mu okay i'm i'm kind of lying slightly um so there's this you can think of your measure mu is a transverse invariant measure so you can slide it from one transversal to another by holonomy. And um, so basically, I want to say is that I'm not going to put t. I'm going to just say that mu of r to the n of i delta is comparable to 1. Basically, if you were to take r to the n of i delta and holonome it down to the bottom, it's going to go around the bottom circle at least once and no more than four times. OK, so but then there is a transfer rule. Um, just like for the um, measure of maximal entropy for the rational map, this implies that um, this is actually equal to 4 to the n times mu of i delta. So the reason is basically what is mu of i delta? mu of i delta is the same as if you took the holonomy, call it like j delta as the holonomy image, mu, uh, mu t, mu t of i delta, mu t c of i delta is equal to uh, Lebesgue of j delta, right? And I dropped my 4 to the n. OK. And um, well, the magenta long curve, what is its measure, mu? That's the same as you, you holonome it down. And that's the same as if I put like um, k delta is the image under holonomy of this long curve. And so that's, that's like, um, so this is also Lebesgue of k delta is this, this long thing, which is on the order of one. But then the point is that on the circle on the bottom, your measure is exactly the uh, Lebesgue measure under fourth power mapping. 
And that transforms with this four to the n. So that's where you're getting this four to the n from is the fact that you're, you have this z goes to z to the fourth in the bottom and you have Lebesgue measure transforms this pullback under z goes to z to the fourth is four times it. And that transforms up to any of these transversals. That's the, that's the picture. And so, so you get this. And so in my, in my limit, my numerator, I get limit delta goes to zero, I get um, a, well, so I wanna take a log, I'm sorry. So this implies that log is not a fraction, that implies that log of mu C of I delta is comparable to minus N log four. So my numerator, I might as well put minus N log four and then I can, I can compute how long it takes to stretch out, just like in the uh, Fisher zeros. So I have, um, I can think of as if uh, uh, lambda C to the N times delta should be comparable to one. That's how, that's to figure out how many iterates it takes for it to get of definite length. It's uh, governed by the behavior near the fixed point. All but finitely many iterates are right near the fixed point. And so that implies that n log lambda c minus n log lambda c is comparable to log delta. So I can put minus n log lambda c, the n's cancel, and I get log four over log lambda c. So it's really kind of the same thing as for the Fisher zeros, except that I, and I didn't explain it perfectly, but it's this, because the measure is holonomy invariant, um, it satisfies the same kind of transformation rule of multiplying by four as the Lebesgue measure on the bottom does, um, which is what exactly what you needed to do this trick. So, um, so I don't know, I didn't explain it that well, but uh, that's a good reason to read our paper instead. So maybe I'll stop there and see what questions people have. Questions, comments? So for the cone field, um, is there a, like a canonical way to construct it or a physical interpretation to see this um, cone field or did you? The, there is, so who's, who, who's talking? I'm just trying to figure oh, out who's talking. It's, it's back. It's back, I thought it was back, but I didn't see your. Yeah, yeah sorry, my rectangle is there. not good. <laughs> so, so this is something really awesome. Um, so for the cone field, um, we often actually work in the U, U, V, W coordinates. Um, and so in the U, V, W coordinates, the um, cylinder, the Li Yang cylinder becomes, um, becomes uh, W equals U bar and uh, mod, mod U over W is uh, Sorry, mod u over v is greater than one. So it's it's some kind of a outside of the unit. You can think of it as the outside of a unit circle in the uh, complex plane, but it's a, it's a Mobius band. And the cone field is exactly described by taking these um, lines tangents to the this become this corresponds to the top of the cylinder, and the bottom is kind of at infinity b at infinity. And the cone field, the, the horizontal cones become exactly these cones. This is u, it's this, the cone not containing the unit, unit disk. And um, the reason it works, um, one way to explain the reason that it works is that these, um, these lines that form the cone those are exactly the um, Li Yang zeros, but rotated around the uh, this Mobius band. You could think on the on a cylinder if you prefer, but it's easier on the Mobius band. They're rotated around the uh, Mobius band, kind of twisted Li Yang zeros, and it turns out that when you pull them back, that they are again smooth and disjoint. And that's, a, that's actually, there's a theorem of uh, Griffiths and Nishimori that says that the Li Yang zeros are simple zeros. And that 
forces that when you pull these guys back, you get a union of a union of the appropriate number of uh, kind of you know smooth curves. Maybe we can move together. But this could be like, you know, maybe this, if I called one of these like L1, this orange stuff could be, you know, R inverse L1. It's a union of smooth curves, disjoint smooth curves. And then you can do a kind of combinatorial proof um, that justifies that it intersects the previous cones in the right way to prove the invariance, but it's a kind of a longer story than I can explain right now. But a key point here is the Griffiths Nishimori theorem, which um, I don't think anybody calls it that, but they're the ones that discovered this fact. So there really is a good principle for why these cone fields exist. Seems that in this elementary situation we can avoid Griffiths in some way. So I don't remember. I don't think that we used it. No, we we didn't. But if you wanted to, the, but I think the mechanism for why it worked. But somehow, this partial capabilicity is a dynamical reflection of the Lee Young theorem and Griffiths in some way. So somehow, it is a dynamical translation through. <laughs> yeah. Martin yeah. Says, you know, it's a reflection of reality of the of zero. So, <clears throat> so Thank I you. mean, in, in the in the diamond hierarchy, Gladys, we didn't think about it in terms of this Griffiths Nishimura, but it, it gives a kind of physical reason why it could work. I can tell you more about it in, in private. Uh, yeah. mm. Yes. Sounds good. Other questions, comments? Uh, I have a question. Uh, yeah. uh, actually, maybe to both of the speakers. It's about hierarchical models in general. So, I mean, there are interesting questions when you consider ferromagnetic model, like Kazik model, and you put a random field, not magnetic field H, but random magnetic field, which can do lots of mine. And uh, there are interesting questions there when uh, in which models you can have phase transitions or not phase transitions. It's a little bit of uh, balance between contours and uh, magnetic field uh, result effect. Uh, so my question is, is there anything about hierarchical models with random magnetic field uh, that people consider it uh, or something like that? First, yes. Uh... Uh, in my papers uh, with uh, Kirimov, we, we proved the existence of phase transition in hierarchical model with random magnetic field. In, in any dimension, right? Uh, so in any, with any parameters, right? Uh, what do you mean parameter? Well, I mean, in, in ASIC model, uh, it is phase transition exists in dimensions uh, larger than three, three and L above, and does oh. exist in dimension two. Uh, because uh, do it to and below, of course. Uh, so, um, and uh, basically, some question is how how randomization act on perturbations which are coming from a random field rather than uh, when you perturb Hamiltonian with a constant field. Yeah, as far as I remember, right, we've approved it uh, for the same parameters as for normal. Hierarchical model of constant field. Yeah, I would expect it because it's kind of kind of high dimensional situation in hierarchical model, but maybe right, 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 right. There is no, there is no renewed interest in this uh, subject of of a normal for lattice models. So maybe it's one can look at it because. Okay. Yeah, it's a good idea. Right, but we, we did it with Kerimov. Interesting, yeah. I, forget, I remember Kirimov, I forgot this. this Thank you. Thank you. So you did it for which model? For Dyson or for, for Dyson? Uh, for Dyson. For Dyson. Mm -hmm. Other questions, comments? So, another question. So, you had this um, rational map on three variables where the three was. Uh, depends on the number of um, uh, conditional partition functions. 
right? Is there a rule of sum of how many conditional partition functions on your hierarch hierarchical uh, model that you need to get a such a renormalization transformation? So, you know, I guess if you if you don't have any kind of symmetries, you presumably need uh, two to the number of vertices at which you're, you're gluing. So here, here we're gluing at two vertices. So we would have four plus or minus one at the top plus or minus one at the bottom, except that there's a symmetry switching the two. So without that symmetry, it would be a, a four, four conditional partition functions. I see. And if you were gluing somehow in a more sophisticated way at three points, then you could have eight. I see. Okay. Other questions? If not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.